tools as well. Um, okay. So yeah, I'm going to start with a bit of an introduction. So many people may not be familiar, so I'll, I'll give it a little overview there. Um, then I'm going to really put the, the entire talk within a specific context. So it will be focused on really the areas that I've researched on uh, most heavily, which will, will be management, uh, management systems using energy storage. And then a little bit about how I see the, the LD load forecasting landscape. A few observations I've made through that time. Some may be obvious, some may be a little bit less um, uh, less obvious, um, but hopefully interesting on the same. And um, and then finish with a few challenges that I think are are quite prominent um, within this context, and and hopefully some opportunities with how we can sort of solve this. So yeah, a little bit about the catapult. So uh, if I'm, I'm sure many of you cross paths with with various parts of the catapult, the energy systems catapult, I should say, uh, as, at, at various points. Um, in your research. Uh, we are one of nine catapults, so we um, we are all set up by Innovate UK and the idea is to sort of work to help support innovation and that's doing that across academia, about, across commercial and, and also across government. So a large proportion of our funding comes from, from government works but we, we also look at sort of commercial endeavours and also we, we do apply for funding. And we're, we're one of nine so there's, there's um, several across the the countries focusing on, on particular areas which the government has seen as quite important. Um, Connected Places is, in, is based primarily in London and it focuses on, on communications and transport and obviously closest to sort of some of the work that we do is the offshore renewable uh, catapult um, and that's based up in uh, Scotland and, and the North East. Um, which you, you might, you guys may have already worked with a little bit, and then there's a digital one. So there's, there's various ones and various areas, and we do try to do a bit of work, which is cross catapult to sort of because obviously they, there's lots of overlap between the different areas. Um, so uh, the catapults expanded quite a bit in the last few years. Um, we're relatively new, um, I think just over five years old, um, but we've gone from a, a relatively a few number of experts to sort of now over 200. So, and there's lots of different areas that we work in. We, when we were in an office, we, we, we primarily were based in Birmingham, but we have another uh, hub in, in Derby, which, um, which uh, is also focused mainly on a lot of the national modeling work that we do. Uh, so we, we do focus on lots of different areas. We try and support a lot of small to medium enterprises. We do a lot of research. Uh, we do some trials and I'll talk about one of our major test sets in a minute. And I'm a, a member of the digital team. So um, we there's a focus on data systems and, and data science. Um, and I'll, I'll also bring in some work about that later. And then we do a lot of modeling and simulation. Um, and I'll, I'll also talk about that very briefly. So. Um, nicely tying in with this workshop series is that, you know, the idea is the catapult ultimately takes a whole systems view. We, we look across all the different vectors. We have sort of portfolios of solutions we look at. So, um, you know, this hopefully fits in, in directly with this workshop. And I would encourage in the future actually having a few other speakers from this area, because as I say, it's quite a large organization and I, I obviously only represent a relatively small part of that. So, uh, as I say, yeah, there's um, we have lots of different platforms. Uh, I'll just mention a few. Um, one of the major ones is we do innovator support platform. So we have small to medium enterprises who come in and they 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 are after some advice. Um, they want to be pointed in the right direction of funding sources, or they will also perhaps actually ask for some services such as data science to help them get their their innovations off the ground. The other major program is the Living Lab, which is a test bed. So this is one of our major assets in the data digital team. It's um, the first initial iteration of this was 100 homes and it focused on heating typically. So we, we had um, heating control systems in there. Uh, we, we tested various heating plans. We, we looked at how consumers responded to things. Um, and we also tried to sort of come up with the to sort of come up with some business plans behind the idea of heating as a service. Um, so this was a, a really um, brilliant way to test various innovations. And now we're trying to expand that out a bit. So the idea is to, with Living Lab 2.0, is to sort of expand this out to lots of different types of technology. It could be electric vehicles. It could be sort of ventilation systems. Um, and we're going to try and scale up the number of households we have there as well. So hundreds of thousands. So. Typically, we can sort of make that available to commercial partners, but we can also put bids together where, where people can, can put, that, put, put that into the bid as, as a way of testing some of the innovations 
that they they want to test. Going backwards. Um, yeah, so actually we also have a lot of different capabilities. I've already mentioned digital and data, and I'll, I'll exhibit that in a bit more detail with some test cases later. Um, we also have a big modeling team, um, and that does modeling at sort of different levels and scales. We have a local energy modeling team, which sort of look at, you know, what's the best way, what's the, cheap, you know, the, the most cost effective way to meet your carbon targets in that local area. So for instance, if you had, um, if you had a, a sort of an old abandoned coal mine there that you may be able to support a heat network. And then we have modeling at sort of a, a higher sort of national level, which sort of looks at similar things. We've got a great markets policy and regulation team, which looks at ways um, of supporting some, you know, the transition in that way. And we have a, a consumer insights team, which looks at this particularly works quite closely with digital. And the idea is to sort of try help design those trials that often are used in living lab to sort of see how people respond and how you can encourage people to be more energy efficient. So there's a little bit more detail there. As I say, um, I'd encourage you to look at our website as well about a bit more about what we do there. Okay, so um, this talk will um, I'll, uh, this talk will mainly focus on low voltage systems, um, but I but I would sort of try and motivate this first by saying how forecasting could be a fundamental component of many of the different mechanisms, vectors, um, and portfolio solutions that will be required for a whole energy system. So what I've presented here is um, these are all actually projects that I, I've I've been involved in, in in some degree or other, um, and I show them because of you know even within um, just the projects that I do, and obviously there's lots more outside of this. Uh, there's still um, a wide variety of things where forecasting plays a key component. Um, so half of these are from within the catapult, half of these are from uh, research within Oxford, but they all have different sort of features and different things which which make them require having to use some degree of anticipation to make things optimal optimal decisions. So the top left is a piece of work we did in um, the uh, as part of the ERIS program which is a, a way of coordinating a lot of major projects from the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. What we did is we noticed a lot of the projects require market solutions so we developed um, some probabilistic day ahead whole, wholesale and literacy market forecasts and the novel thing here is we looked at a particular method uh, which looked at modeling the entire supply and demand curves. And this, of course, may become more even more important as we move towards local uh, energy markets. Uh, the second one is, as it will, I'll talk a bit more throughout this talk because this will be the main context, but it is about using storage devices to help um, support the networks. And being able to anticipate that with forecasts helps you make more and more optimal decisions. Uh, the third thing here is a, is a piece of work we did with um, uh, some data from Greater Manchester. Um, heat, uh, hundreds of heat pumps were installed in some of the homes. Uh, they turned, they had to turn down the, the demand at certain times to try and reduce the energy. And one thing we need, we required to do was try and understand how much turn down was done there. And obviously to do that, you'd kind of have to estimate um, how much demand was actually done. And therefore this requires essentially a, a, a prediction, an estimate of this. Slightly different here, the, the previous three are kind of all very time series centric. Um, we also did, and this was part of the Thames Valley Vision project I worked on, we did some long term scenario planning. Um, and this was to try and look at the idea of if you have large uptakes of various technologies, what would be the impact on the network? And therefore, what we're doing here is more, um, more agent based model forecasts. But I suppose the point here is to show the diversity of the different types of prediction when we talk about forecasts. Um, as I mentioned about Living Lab, one of the major things we were trying to do was look at um, how to control people's um, energy systems in an optimal way to provide the comfort that they request. So um, people would come up with a plan which said, I, I want the target temperature here and then here later in the day. Um, and therefore, you know, we, it's a relatively simplistic way of, of, of uh, predicting. But what we needed, needed to do is make sure that the, the system heated at the appropriate time so that the target temperature was met. So this was a lot a lot more physical type um, model, maybe more than some of the more data driven models. Um, but obviously it has to learn on the previous data. And the last bit I put on here is this is um, this is weather forecasts are not not directly um, linked to energy systems. But of course, as we all know, there's there's a huge um, interplay between between um, weather forecasts and and um, 
and energy systems. And as we move forward, maybe the more advanced types of forecasts like ensemble forecastings will play a part in that. And, and, wh and whether numerical weather prediction was, was what my PhD was on. So, you know, it's nice to sort of come full circle with that. OK, so having sort of shown the sort of uh, glimpses of where uh, forecasting plays an important part throughout the energy systems, I'm now going to focus mainly in the, the, my speciality, which has been mainly looking at low voltage networks uh, for the past 10 years or so. So the application I'm, I'm mainly going to talk about will be um, a very simple case of, of trying to reduce peak demand on the network. So we're trying to shift demand to earlier in the day. So we charge the, we charge the device here and then we discharge during the peak period. What makes the LV case particularly interesting is that the, the demand is relatively volatile. So if we're talking about this is the national system demand, this is um, the demand over uh, two days at the national level of the UK, and here's just 50 households, where 50 is, a, is approximately the, the size of a, of a low voltage feeder. When I say low, low voltage here, I'm, I'm mainly talking about sort of the last, the last substation before um, meeting demands. What I think is also important about here is, as we could say we're moving away from the whole systems, but as we move towards low, localized energy networks, I think the low voltage will play a more and more increasingly important aspect of that. Okay, so the first application, a specific application within that, the, within the, the, the low voltage data manage, uh, energy management is looking at residential feeders. So a large part of the work I did on the Thames Valley Vision was focused in this area. We then did go and actually test it on real networks and we, we came back with positive results um, from, the, from the limited trials we did manage to, 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 um, to run. And the idea is just to forecast sort of the demand and then reduce the peak. Um, assuming this sort of demand is what you'll see. Um, when I say residential networks, I should also say that these networks, when I say residential, what I mean is mainly sort of urban, sort of slightly suburban networks, which are, are uh, mainly connected to residential, but that doesn't mean you can't have some, some landlord lighting or you can have some street furniture and, and obviously some small, small commercial businesses as well. What I think is quite interesting about low voltage demand is the diversity. Um, but at the same time, the degree of regularity you get. So here, what I've shown is three feeders. Uh, these are all, by the way, based on data from Bracknell. So a small, a small town just outside of, a medium sized town, I should say, outside of London. Um, and they, they have all, you know, they're all monitored and each feeder was monitored. And therefore, what we could do is kind of analyze a variety of different networks that we could see. So what's quite nice is we do see some regularities. And obviously when we're building forecast models, um, we want to manipulate that and make sure we, we can incorporate that into our models to, to produce something that at least gives you the typical demand we see. Uh, what's nice here is you can see the annual seasonalities. There's also weekly seasonalities and daily ones. Um, and that's obviously something that's, that's useful uh, when trying to produce these models, because often the assumption is that the, the past is very much um, going to be how the future will look. However, even if we do have those regularities, what you can see is a very a big diversity uh, across the feeders. So this top one here has uh, 44 consumers and 44 of them are, are residential, but this, all, this consumer here has actually 42, so very similar number of consumers, and also they're all residential, but you can see there's a big difference between the two. Uh, whereas this one doesn't seem to be affected by the holidays, this one does seem to have a large effect. So here you can see Christmas and here you can see Easter, um, and you know the, the, the point here is that even though we have all these similarities, you can even if, if they're almost the same types of consumers, uh, you know, there's a lot of diversity. And even here, you can see this is just one commercial consumer. You know, the, the behavior is very different. In fact, this is landlord lighting. So for an office uh, area, and as you can see, the, you know, the demand drops significantly. The implication for forecasts then is that there perhaps isn't one forecast model that fits all the solutions. And there might have to be a bit more bespoke way of approaching it, or at least trying to combine various models together to, to get a, um, a more optimal, a more optimal forecast. Uh, the second application is, is work by a PhD student of mine. Um, the idea is to also look at peak reduction, but we're looking at rubber tire gantry cranes. So these are uh, large cranes that operate at, um, at seaports. Uh, this one is at Felixstowe. And the idea is to move the big containers and then uh, you know drop them onto lorries so they can be transported further or vice versa 
and how this 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 is obviously a bit more bespoke but i think it creates some other challenges so first of all you can see these cranes operate three, 365 days a year they're 24 hours seven so there isn't that regularity you get the daily sort of seasonality that you get with the residential feeders you, you know it looks a lot more volatile um, however, hope isn't all lost because we do find that there's other explanatory variables which are quite important for describing that demand, particularly the size of the container, which may be information that is available to uh, to a to the the RGG crane operator, and then the number of moves, which is a little bit more complicated, but feasibly there could be ways of doing some demand side response there to the demand side management, which could help alleviate things if required. Okay, so. Um, that's sort of the the applications which will will inform the discussion throughout the the rest of this section um and now i kind of want to look at where we where we currently currently are and, and maybe some of the fundamental questions that come up with this sort of work now uh this first slide is really um this is um this is this is from a paper uh from the the organizers of the global energy forecasting competition in 2014 it was one I was a participant in, and so these are major energy forecasters um, across the world. Um, and they had a, a they sort of placed based on their sort of uh, experience and opinion of where they believe um, the different areas of, of power forecasting um, and energy based forecasting sit um, a sort of in a maturity scale, sort of from point forecasting and also probabilistic. And so what you can see here, I mean, this is a little bit out of date, so things have moved on a little bit from here. Um, however, it does give a little bit general feel of, of where the state of play is. So down here in the bottom left, you have um, solar power forecasting. Now, I think there's a lot of brilliant work being done by people like uh, Jack Kelly. And I recently saw a great talk by, um, um, by uh, some of the members at DTU who are doing some really good stuff on this. So I think this has obviously moved a little bit more, a lot more than, than it was. But it's one of the toughest areas. Um, because you know we're looking at um, the, a lot of the variability in solar power forecasting. What makes it inaccurate is is the movement of clouds, which are particularly difficult. And machine learning is is making a lot of inroads into this area now. Up here, you have longer term load forecasting. Of course, this is mainly primarily looking at probabilistic because of the, the long horizons. Down here is electricity price forecasting. Although I, I can say since 2016, some brilliant work in this area has been done by people like Rafael Voron and and Florian Zeal. Um, and up to here you have wind power forecasting, which has been looked at for a long time. And, and the focus mainly has been in, in, in uh, probabilistic and, you know, and, and I'd say if you, you wanted to look at some brilliant authors in this area, look at people like Jeffrey Browell, we're doing some really good work there. But down here is kind of what I'm focusing on, which is the short term load forecasting. And I kind of agree here that the maturity of it in point forecasting is, is there's been a lot of work in this area. And since, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of focus on understanding the load at a system level, um, but there hasn't necessarily been a lot of the probabilistic. And so what I would say here is this also should be split up a bit further. You know, we, what about the low voltage demand? If you look at different levels of the grid, this would change significantly, I would say. So what I did is it's a little unscientific, but I think it gives you a good feel for um, the state of play is I just did simple counts based on some basic searches in Google Scholar about the different types of forecasting and for different years. And, you know, as you can see, load forecasting has got a, a huge amount of work um, behind it, you know, and it's ever increasing. But then if you compare this to sort of the low voltage level, um, and the smart meter level loads of forecasting, um, there's still a lot of, of missing work here. Now, you could say that maybe this is because it's, it's you know, we don't need to be doing forecasts in this area. Um, you know, it would appear from things like data man uh, from energy management that we do need to be doing forecasts. Um, but there's a, there seems to be an, in a lot of the literature, um, and I'm sure many people in this area would sort of agree that, um, often forecasting is not necessarily included in the applications where you'd expect it to be used. So um, this could be, sometimes the opinion is, is because forecast is easy, you can do it quite quite well, or perhaps there's, it's not that important to do the forecasting. Um, we can use any old method and it won't make a particular difference whether we use an accurate or an in, in, inaccurate forecast. Uh, and unfortunately that means there's very little evidence of sort of the impact of the forecast in, in many of the applications. Um, 
but I'd say, I'd say in contrast as well, it's interesting if you look at the forecasting community, there's a lot of fo focus on trying to make things as, as accurate as possible and adding more and more uh, bells and whistles and making them more sophisticated to add a small amount of um, improvement in the forecast. So I think there's maybe a balance here where we need to have a focus on the forecast and its, and its impact within the application. Um, and just to kind of sort of illustrate this here, I've put a few examples from some of the work that I've done over the years. Um, here, what we've got is peak reduction, and, and the example here is what we've done is we've sized the battery here, so it would be you'd, you'd be able to make um, get a 20% peak reduction. But in many cases, what you get is, um, as you see in the top left, what we've done is we've used a perfect forecast, i.e., we've just used the actuals to to determine how the battery will use it, and then we've done, looked at two different control methods with five different types of forecasts, and as you can see, there's a big difference. So if you are reporting your results without using the, the you know the truth about the the uh, forecast uncertainty there might be a bit of a misleading result in terms of how how much peak reduction you you could practically achieve so here we've got sort of um you know five percent peak reduction on average if we use some of these relatively sophisticated forecasts um but this is nothing compared to the sort of average 17 percent peak reduction you get um when you're using a perfect forecast um and then if you illustrate down here this is with the rtg crane if you use an accurate forecast, you sort of can achieve, again, we've got the ideal again, which means using perfect knowledge, we can do a brilliant job, of course, but then if we use forecasts, you know, we can get a big difference whether we use an accurate one or an inaccurate forecast. And then finally, just to hammer the point home here, what we've got here is a few points um, of, um, we've got the forecast error, and as we get less accurate, we, we achieve less peak reduction. I mean, it looks quite nice and linear, but I'd be careful extrapolating this too much because there's obviously not a lot of points here. So I hope that kind of establishes where I think there is there is a need for for kind of a bit more focus on on the the forecast element of an application, um, which you know um, can can really benefit benefits in the long run. Okay, so now I've um, sort of set the landscape. We've set the application. I just want to make a few observations. Some of them may be, as I say, obvious. Some of them may be a little bit surprising. So I hope there's something interesting here for everyone. One thing um, uh, I noticed from, I'm, I'm currently writing a review paper with a few authors on low voltage forecasting and, and it does come out in that, is we've noticed that a lot of the, the there's a lot of work on hierarchical forecasts and, and how we can sort of make coherent forecasts throughout the, the network. Um, one thing that's been uh, noticed is that there's obviously this, there's often this assumption that there's a, a power law relationship between, you know, as you make the feed is bigger, and with the uh, with this error, so excuse the map here, but this works also for other relative errors. So it's not necessarily the, the most fit metric to, to measure these things, but the relationship usually usually stands either way, and you get this sort of smooth power law relationship. And the the issue is that often there's an assumption that low voltage networks are simply aggregations of, of sort of typical households. Um, and when we, we started looking at all, uh, this is 100 feeders in total, by the way, for, for the Bracknell area, um, we noticed actually the, the fit wasn't quite as smooth as, as perhaps um, we would have expected from, from seeing that literature. And what we did is we found these sort of anomalous feeders, which were sort of quite a way off the line. And when we investigated further, we, we found that they had specific characteristics, which made them, them um, particularly less accurate compared to the sort of standard ones. Um, and what we found was that they had a large numbers of overnight storage heaters, um, and these ones had a we say small number of, but there's still at least 60% of the of the consumers on there had overnight storage heaters. And we also found that this this guy over here was just a pure landlord lighting, which I showed earlier, and he also was was way off the line. There's two others here we couldn't identify the reasons why they were off. There was some suggestions, um, but because we didn't have great information. On those feeders we couldn't we couldn't really extrapolate that to say this is a definitive answer for why that was the case um so you know one thing there is interesting if we want to do the forecasting this kind of feeds into what i was saying as well we need bespoke methods to be able to 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 do accurate forecasting at low voltage networks but we also have to be careful of of how we view them and understand the, the diversity that exists there uh, this just kind of finalizes the picture a bit here, but also does point out quite an important uh, aspect of this. Now we try and do the peak reduction in terms of the size of the feeder. So the larger feeders are up here and the smallest ones here. So it's sort of in the same order as that. And you kind of look at the peak reduction. 
across those and you get what you expect as you get more accurate you get more um more peak you get a, a higher peak reduction but there's still a lot of diversity so there's still a lot of um issues here and i think the solution here is to start looking more at the stochastic aspects uh, another aspect of this is is explanatory variables um when we um this the sort of system level forecast it's often assumed that weather variables are or a core element of this. And we were lucky enough on the Thames Valley Vision project to have not just access to weather uh, data, uh, but we also had access to the forecasts of the weather data. So that means we could also compare, um, you know, what impact we could get from the uncertainty of the explanatory variables. Um, and although uh, we did find there was there was some correlations and, you know, we modeled this in various ways, not just this linear uh, thing here. And we, we, we looked at lots of models, quanta, uh, we looked at uh, probabilistic ones and point ones, including the temperature into the um, to the to the methods uh, actually was detrimental to the accuracy of the forecast uh, which was quite surprising for us um, initially um, we, you know we, we found that it also the how detrimental it was increased relatively um, according to how accurate your your original model was so the more accurate models had the the were given the most detrimental effect by including temperature so this sort of suggests that um, that that the temperature was actually a, a sort of um it was it was a spurious variable to be training on and actually we we ended up with we, we the, there was a lot of collinearity with uh, seasonality which we believe caused this issue and the other reason was perhaps that heating wasn't as strong uh, an influencer on electricity usage in bracknell as, as we would have thought because actually maybe most of the heating there was um was gas um, but if we do move towards electrified heating, then of course these things will change. But what I think this slide emphasizes is that uh, there are some assumptions that we we go into these these modeling environments with, which are relatively new, and, and I think they need a little bit more investigation. Okay, so I've alluded to this in the in a, a couple of slides previously. Um, but as you can see, as you get smaller numbers of households, it gets much more difficult to forecast because you have a lot less regularity and you have a lot more spikiness. So these, as you go down to the size of the, the network, you can see you get sort of spikes, which are, which are missing the demand. And this uh, produced a, an interesting problem. When, when I was first looking at this, this sort of uh, smart meter data, we were trying to produce some forecasts um, for households. And we, we produced a whole array of different methods, uh, some very sophisticated, some of them very simple. Um, one of them we produced would be this like flat one here, um, which would just be the average value uh, from the previous week and just use that. And um, no matter how sophisticated our, our complex models were, when we were measuring the errors in these things, we were getting the, the flat forecast was beating um, the, the sort of more sophisticated models. Um, and so we examined this a little bit more detail. So this is sort of the illustrates the sort of problems we were seeing. So say we get this sort of actual like the green. What we then produce is something like this red one. Um, and for all intents and purposes, this red one is, is a subjectively good forecast. If you charge your battery device uh, into anticipation of this spike, uh, this spike, um, you can anticipate uh, you can anticipate charging that device, but also if you have some sort of online control, you can discharge it during this spike and, you know, you have at least the chance of doing it. With this flat one, you have no chance at all. But this this one here is much worse in terms of, say, errors like RMSE than the flat one is. And the reason for this is this double penalty error. Now, this is relatively, this were, at the time was about, um, I think we published this paper in about 2014, but it was relatively new in the energy sector. Um, but this thing had been seen quite a bit in, in weather forecasts where precipitation forecasts were slightly different and therefore they get quite large errors. Um, and the reason for this is because you predict a spike where the spike didn't occur and then you miss the spike where it actually did occur. So you get penalized twice, whereas this flat forecast only gets penalized once. So we did something very basic uh, and that was just to try and um, do a little permutation. And so all we did is we we allow some limited um, translation of or cross um, matching between between the data points to minimize it, and we sort of limited that to say an hour and a half either side of of each point, and therefore we we looked at this as an adjusted error. Now there's lots of things that are uh, that are wrong about this. This is not a metric, so there's still some ideas of having. Um, 
you know, you can still have uh, limitations in terms of and some inconsistencies in your results. But the point was to try and see what level of problem there was in terms of peaks being shifted. And, and this makes sense, of course, right? Um, if people get to work a bit earlier, then they, they perhaps will leave a little earlier and therefore all their demand is shifted around. And so to just emphasize sort of what we, we saw when we, we looked about, I think several hundred of the Irish smart meter datas. Um, now I'm gonna, I, there's a lot of detail in this plot, so I won't go into it, but the essential detail here is that we split the we split the, the results into sort of three main quadrants. Um, and what they mean is we're comparing a kind of relatively sophisticated metal, method, not very sophisticated, but relative to the flat forecast that it is. And we compare that to the flat forecast. So it, are you good uh, against, if you use a typical measure like an RMSE error, are you, um, are you good in it? And then when you do the adjustment, are you good in it as well? Are you better than the flat? So are you better than the flat in the old measure or in the new measure? And if you're in this quadrant, you know, it doesn't make much difference what type of measure you use. And you can see there's a lot in there, you know, so that's, that's, that's quite relatively good news. I think what was disturbing was we saw actually a high, a high proportion of them, I think it was 50% or something, um, would have scored quite poorly um, according, uh, according to a traditional error measure like RMSE, but would have done better with the, the uh, adjusted error that we created, which suggested to us that there, there was obviously, there's some flaws in trying to understand your accuracy of your model and the usefulness of your model based on the traditional measure. Another thing that's maybe interesting here is that um, we have this quadrant where it doesn't matter what metric you use, you're, you're not going to beat the flat forecast. And, and, and I think this is an important point to emphasize here is that sometimes we always talk about let's try and make the forecast more and more accurate. Well, with some people, you're never going to be able to make that accurate. Um, you're always going to have some issues. And so really, I mean, if we're talking about how to approach this problem properly, then if we're looking at smart meters, we probably should be looking more probabilistically. So that's what I'll talk about. OK, so I'm going to only just briefly talk about this, but what I first will do is try and extend the, um, the, the sort of basic Google analysis, Google Scholar analysis of, um, of forecasting probabilistically at LB. As you remember um, from the previous slide, um, there's not a load of a lot of li uh, literature relative to sort of um, sort of higher voltages on LB load forecasting. Um, but obviously the case will be that it's even lower for um, for a sort of low voltage probabilistic um, forecasting. Although I think if there is a little bit of encouragement here that of the literature that is in LV load forecasting, um, you know, a third of it is really, you know, is doing, um, a third of it at least is looking at probabilistic approaches, which which perhaps is the is the right way to do things. What makes this quite complicated? Um, as well as that this is obviously a bit, there's a lot more sophisticated methods required to be able to produce um, probabilistic forecasts. What I've been talking to about up till now has been uh, point forecasts, which is just you produce a single estimate. But there's sort of three main categories, I would say, of, of uh, probabilistic forecasts. Um, quantile forecasts are probably predictive intervals are, are probably the, some of the most popular and you sort of produce a high and a low estimate, maybe a median as well. Um, and then there'll be other things where you look at things like density forecasts. So you kind of look at the spread of the data. And I would say, um, you know, you can at least get an idea of sort of the range of, of, of certainty you have. But one thing it doesn't tell you is any of the interdependencies between different time steps. And that's why you move into sort of ensemble forecasts. Uh, and the idea is you generate lots of different ensembles and each one of them is, is a, a realization from the multivariate distribution. So each one of these represents a possibility that could have occurred. And for storage device applications like the one I talk about, this is quite important because um, you need to know this interdependencies. And if you recall the, the smart meters where you have the peaks shifting around, um, this would be captured by these types of forecasts. And here's sort of an example used for the RTG crane. Um, and we have we published some work on this, looking at how um, you can use stochastic um, opt, uh, model predictive control uh, using probabilistic forecasts and and what we have here is just an example of how we've shown some improvement by looking at more stochastically than purely uh, deterministically. 
and you although you, you, you see the peak reduction is slightly increased you can see there's there's a little bit more significant increase if you look at it as, as, as the box plot um, the other complication of course is that um, assessing the forecasts is now a little less straightforward than using the traditional error measures RMSE and uh, and mate and uh, mean absolute error we have to start looking at what is called probabilistic scoring functions so um, popular ones that have been used, this was used in the global energy forecasting competition, and what you do is you essentially have a weighted cost function and it's weighted according to sort of your quantile. You have things like the continuous rank probability score, which are very popular, and this is a way of sort of measuring the difference between what is the observed empirical distribution and your forecasted distribution. And these are mainly used for sort of density forecasts. Uh, and then there's the energy score, which is which has been uh, considered for multivariate forecasts, and is sort of represented here um, as a way of how you'd calculate it. And you, you're sort of measuring the difference between your uh, realizations from the the multivariate forecast and the observation, and then also the sort of variance uh, across uh, the the ensembles. Another thing which is catching some traction, and, and I'd, I'd, uh, there's some papers by Pierre Pinson and and, and Jeffrey Browell which have looked at this is is the idea of statistical significance, because in the forecasting literature, there's a lot of focus on the, the scoring of the, the um, forecasts, but it appears that there's often very small changes and small improvements uh, in these. And so the question really is, are they statistically significant? Um, and there are some suggestions, if you look at forecasting competitions on things like Kaggle, that even though there may be a ranking, those top five, four or five entries may also be very similar statistically and, and maybe there's not much you can say between them so that's an interesting area that seems to be being looked at now okay so having sort of said all that um some of there's some challenges that come out of that type of work uh, which i think are interesting but there's also some other opportunities i'm going to talk about two main ones here um the first one is that there um there, there might be a worry about having if, if we need these sophisticated methods there's perhaps a worry about having the the um, the skills um, the the personnel available to do that. There was a an older report which sort of said two thirds of data vores, which means data intensive companies, and who they struggle to to uh, recruit an analysts. Um, and and then this is updated. There's a there's a 2020 report which had looked at sort of various uh, data rounded up from LinkedIn and McKinsey, etc., which have said that you know there's a big gap between the postings for data scientists and and um, you know the people looking for these jobs, and also where where the companies themselves um, have worries about where they will be able to um, to recruit. And of course, you know um, places like yourselves are are key to sort of uh, developing those talents. Um, and you know, hopefully, you know, the emphasis on, on energy analytics will, will help to progress that sort of thing. Um, another major challenge um, is is about data. Now, often, and my own experience in here, and I'm, I'm again using a, a very you know subjective, uh, well, a relatively unscientific Google search here to illustrate the point. But this is also from my experience and, and my, my review of various papers. Um, of the smart meter sort of research and forecasting, a large proportion of them um, seem to focus on the Irish smart meter data. Here, the point is to say it's around 10%, but um, that means everybody's using the same data to try and create methods, to compare methods, to, to, to develop and improve those models. Um, and, and when it's not the Irish smart meter data, it's often a bespoke um, private data set that nobody can check or, or test their own methods against. Um, and that kind of makes it quite limited in terms of how do you develop these methods and how do you really understand, um, you know, the, the impact of your methods on a wider data set. And this kind of leads on to a piece of work we've been doing in the Catapult in the digital team. So colleagues of mine, um, also including the uh, non-exec director, Laura Sandys, who's obviously joined us, have uh, done a piece of work uh, mid last year uh, on the Energy Data Task Force. And this was to try and understand how we can monetize the energy uh, system um, and support digitalization. And we came up with um, five recommendations, um, which were tried to try and help support that digitalization. Um, I'll just briefly go some, through some of them here. Um, one was to say that digitalization was key to actually uh, to, to help drive innovation. The other ideas were try and make catalogs and better document the, the energy system. 
But one quite key concept here was the idea of presumed open, uh, which was which came out of the um, came out of the report. The reason behind this is that often energy companies, um, even if they do know they have certain data sets, um, are often quite protective sometimes of their data, or they they're a bit wary that there might be some privacy concerns. And therefore that data stays, even though it could be incredibly useful, uh, stays locked away and, and innovators like yourselves uh, may not be able to access them. Um, so the idea was to maybe start from an idea of saying, let's say that all the data is open. And if you can't make it open, uh, then you, you have to kind of give a good reason why that's not the case. So, you know, there may obviously be some genuine concerns about security and privacy. And of course, if that's the case, then you have to put more extra stringent um, restrictions on it. Uh, but if you can release it by simply anonymizing it or doing some various other uh, data modification techniques, then do that. So you, you might get some data which is purely open. There's other categories where they have sort of various restrictions on it, maybe in terms of maybe in terms of how you can use it, or maybe there's some licensing restrictions. And then maybe it just no matter what you do, that data is just too dangerous to release and, and therefore you, you can have it closed. But the hope is by starting from a presumed open uh, viewpoint, uh, more data can be released and, and used. I'll just briefly make this, the, the nice thing here is that often a lot of the companies have been really positive um, about uh, about these these um, these changes and these suggestions, um, and one of the things that's going forward because of this is the presumed open data project with Western Power Distribution, uh, with the Catapult as well, and the Centre for Sustainable Energy. And the idea is now Western Power Distribution are taking those ideas forward um, from the Energy Data Task Force, taking those recommendations and trying to apply it to uh, many of their data sets. Um, that they hold. So the idea behind the project is two main recommendations is to try and make that data more visible, but also try and maximize how you use that data, which is, I think, a real key point. It's not just about making that data available, it's making data that's useful available. So what we've been doing is we've been looking what data they have, what data they maybe didn't have captured in a systematic way as well, and, and putting it all together. We've been engaging internally within the company of how they could best use their data, but also had workshops where we talk to external stakeholders and, and try and say, well, what would you do with this data if you could if you could access it? How would it support various use cases you have? Um, and the open data triage has been applied, which is the methodology for this presumed open data. Um, and what key part I'm playing in this is, is organizing a data science competition. So um, this is hopefully uh, arriving early in 2021. So if you're interested, please let me know. It'd be great to have people engaging with this. This will be a, an energy management storage problem using some of Western Power Distribution's data. So um, I would love if you guys could get engaged in that and you know, show us some of the best techniques to apply there and, and, how we can, um, and, and how we can really show the value of the data they hold. Um, also, we're, we're hoping to, for one of the entries, we're hoping to, um, to offer them a publication for free in the journal, in, in Energy's journal as part of the, um, the guest, um, the guest journal, the guest editor I'm, um, where I'm uh, on the special issue, which I'm guest editor on. Um, so, and also please apply if you have some interesting um, papers, uh, I'd love to see them, um, especially if we're looking sort of any, anything about smart energy systems and, and how prediction maybe can help these things. And the last thing I just want to mention is that the, um, if you're really interested in forecasting, I, I really recommend getting involved in the, the forecasting um, uh, community. Um, recently, the um, UK established a chapter in um, of the International Institutes of Forecasters. This is run by uh, lots of people in forecasting, not necessarily energy. They're all from different business areas who um, establish how, you know, like they all have very similar problems. So whether you're in energy forecasting, or whether you're in business forecasting, you, you all have very similar issues, which you, um, um, which they have to, to tackle. And um, I recommend getting involved because they're, they're a brilliant group and they have a meeting coming up in 11th of December. If you're interested, uh, even search for the thing or get in contact with me and I can forward you to it. So that's all I wanted to talk about. I've missed, there's lots of topics I could talk about, um, which I haven't here, um, combining forecasts, transfer learning and hierarchical forecasting. Um, it's a really exciting area at the moment. Um, so, yeah, if you have any questions, I'd love to to hear hear from you. Thanks very much, Steve. That was that was super interesting. You covered a, a huge amount there.
Um, Hopefully not too much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I guess if anyone has any questions, either you can put them in the chat and I'll read them out, um, or you can um, raise your hand if you'd like to ask it in person. Um, I've got a bunch of questions. I'll just give a sec in case there's anyone um, has got something, uh, no got something burning. Um, okay, it looks like uh, Fatima has a question, uh, which is just coming up on the chat now. Yeah, many thanks for the great talk. So I have a quick question. Uh, did you consider incorporating, uh, for example, renewable energy such as uh, uh, wind or PV? and battery storage uh, to, in, uh, to your uh, load forecast to improve the uh, distribution system? Good question. Um, the, the work that I presented there hasn't, and I mean, uh, one of the major difficulties there is the, um, is the, the uh, having that data available. Uh, However, frankly, I'm uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just uh, working on the uh, PV forecast and uh, yeah, you're right because uh, I really struggled with uh, accessing to data sets. So I, I, I was just, it, it left me with no choice to just gather data from different uh, websites such as Renewable Energy Laboratory and uh, weather uh, websites and mm -hmm. merge them to just build a data set. Uh, so I, I will of course make them uh, publicly available because right now my uh, work is under review. But uh, the main concern that right now I'm just uh, telling you is about uh, just incorporating the load forecast because I haven't seen uh, such work that uh, they to incorporate the uh, load forecast mm. with, for example, PV battery system to just improve the uh, distribution system. Yeah, it's um, it's a really good point, and um, there's a couple of things. There's um, yeah, the data is you know you either have to create often there's not huge amounts of data sets out there for PV. Um, yeah, exactly. You, you often have to create them maybe yourself, which kind of loses some of the exciting bit, which is this volatility with the, the clouds. Um, however, mm -hmm. um, so partly of the challenge I mentioned earlier, um, mm -hmm. The hope is we're going to be releasing with that the OpenLV data from YIEL, which is, so what the idea is hopefully we can release that data and it's part of the challenge. So we can utilize uh, PV as part of that. So I'd definitely be involved in that. I would love to, um, uh, to see what sort of things, um, sort yeah, of the different methodologies apply. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that data, that's one thing we're aiming here is to try and release data. Um, and part of that was PV. Um, the other thing is obviously the other complication is sometimes we did have PV as part of the Thames Valley Vision, but it was often um, already incorporated into the demand. So you wouldn't necessarily see the overall effect of it. It was already, um, how should we say, it was, you're looking at um, imported and exported demand, yeah. which already incorporated the PV, but it's a really good point. And yeah, getting that data available, if, yeah, I mean, if you want to share that data that we're also trying to work on a platform, which, which keeps, a, a list of all the data that's available and, and, and tries to make things things open to people. So that's yeah. all about what the catapult is focused on. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's a really great point. Yeah, another point is that necessarily we don't need uh, a cloud because uh, based on uh, what I uh, found to the best of my knowledge, the uh, cloud, uh, we, don't, we cannot just forecast uh, for, do not, uh, we cannot just predict the solar output based on the cloud covering or because we need this kind of density and uh, we need the data about cloud to just be able to uh, forecast the solar output. But what I uh, found is that uh, we can have the weather data such as solar irradiance, temperature and zenith, and then we can just uh, forecast the solar output based on this weather data. So it is necessarily, we don't need the cloud data to just uh, be able to forecast the solar output. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, as I say, the, I think the interesting part is, is difficult to incorporate, which is that stochasticity coming from oh, yeah. clouds. Yeah. Um, there is yeah. some interesting work where people look at the correlation between solar panels. I, I saw a recent talk by uh, Henrik Madsen, um, mm -hmm. whose name I was trying to remember early from DTU. And they'd looked at the correlation um, between the different panels to try and improve forecasts. Oh, okay. So I'd recommend that I can always send the, the link to, I think the talk's online. So I can always um, send you the link to that if you're interested. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. So from David Greenwood, uh, related to a project we were doing, how would you account for significant changes in demand patterns due to, for example, COVID-19 lockdowns? Yes, um, unfortunately, I've not had the chance to look into um, a lot of this. Now, I think what's in the what's probably most important then in, in this case is um, obviously you've got people working from home a bit more. It would be interesting to see how it changes across countries. I haven't looked into it in significant ways. I could obviously make some assumptions that, you know, we are maybe looking a lot more like, um, you know, the sort of weekends in how we, um, we operate. From a forecasting perspective, I think it's quite interesting to look at adaptive methods then. I think this kind of highlights the importance of having forecasts which train constantly and sort of eliminate some of the older data um, so they can they can adapt to these changes. I haven't looked into a lot of detail, but there's um, there is a lot of interesting work out there. And I would say I did notice a few um, papers from uh, Florian Zeal, um, who works at Deutsche Essen, who'd looked into COVID's effects. So um, I'd recommend having a look at some of his work because um, there is. Yeah, I wish I'd had a chance to look into it in more detail because it looks very interesting. Cool. And then we have another question here from Flora Chabonnier, who says, um, with respect to data availability that you're talking about, um, do you know is there data on weather forecasts versus actual weather, um, which is also publicly available? So this is yeah, weather forecast and the corresponding outturn, I suppose. Yeah, um, it's it's really difficult to find now. So so if you're um, now so for myself, if you're working with commercial organisations, you, you often have to buy. The forecast data you can but if you're an academic then there's brilliant resources and uh, from the ecmwf where you can you can uh, access all their uh, reanalysis data um, at very high resolution uh, for all their variables and you can also access the ensemble forecasts which is even more valuable um, so if you get the chance i'd look into to the access to ecmwf's weather uh, data and that's all free if you're an academic you get the academic license and the other thing is it has the cc by 4.0 license which means it's it's uh, shareable and you can use it uh, however you please really um so uh there's you know there, there's a lot of excitement they just i think they did that quite recently as well making changing the license on their products uh, so if you're an academic you can get that license I'd, I'd approach them you have to talk to the computing representative um, and they have all that data available so yeah, and that's that's a great resource. They have the reanalysis. So the, the other thing to look at is there's three different types of weather data, really. You have observations, you have the forecasts, but you also have the reanalysis. So it can be a little bit of a minefield. So it, there's a little bit of a steep learning curve to try and understand numerical weather pr prediction products. Um, but you have the, those are the three core ones. Um, and the reanalysis is essentially the forecasts, but they're historical ones. So it's the training of the model on the historical observations. Uh, at the grid points. Cool and um, for those who missed it last two weeks ago we had Hannah from Reading gave a nice talk and sort of oh, talked brilliant. about some of those terms so that we'll put the video on that with the videos from this talk and the previous talks will be going on the website hopefully before. Oh, that's great great link. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we've just about run out of time um, so before we thank Stephen just two quick notices um, so firstly uh, the Supergen Energy Networks Hub uh, which is sort of helping support this has an early career, career research seed corn fund out at the moment they're, they're looking to sponsor 10 projects um, of around sort of three three thousand pounds each so if you have an idea that you want to sort of spend a, a bit of time then can have a look on the supergem website there'll be there's this sort of more information there and in two weeks we have our next speaker which will be um, professor kiri baker from uh, uc boulder uh, because it, uh, there on mountain time is going to be at a later, the talk will be at the later time of 3.30 p.m. And she'll be talking about um, her talk, which is from transmission to thermostat, integrated building grid operations. And she's a um, super knowledgeable professor. She's done a lot of, a lot of work um, on computational methods. She sort of has a computer science background. Um, so with that, everyone, thanks very much to Steve. And thank, thank we'll you, everyone. Hope, and we'll hope to see you all again soon. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks and, uh, so much, Steve. Yeah. Uh, also, yeah, feel free to email me, um, contact me if you have any further questions or follow-ups.
So thanks a lot, everyone. That's really great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. Thanks, Jiro.